Okay, so why study computer science? This is not a voting one. This is just because computer science can help us solve important problems. Hopefully I gave you some ideas of how um, we can solve important problems with computer science. Um, the second thing is, um, the second reason to study computer science was, is because computer programming is fun and there are still a lot of new problems to solve. So you may think that, you know, computer science is kind of a, an established old career by now. We haven't we figured out all those computer science problems and there's nothing left to do. So let me talk a little bit about some of the really cool problems in computing. I'm going to give you, I, I was at this meeting um, at, that I mentioned before and I want to talk about a couple of sort of major breakthroughs in computing and, and think about what this means about computing performance because that slide was really about computing performance. So. Um, uh, Jeanette Wang, who used to be the head of the, um, the computer science program at NSF, is now re on the faculty at CMU where she's been. Um, she, she gave a talk at the beginning of this meeting talking about, you know, how do we use computing today? So you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you use your iPhone. And I said, before you even get out of bed, right? And I said, no way. And then I looked using Google and I looked and said, it turns out they've done a study and it says that 30% of people use their iPhone in the morning before they ever get out of bed. So, okay, there you are with your iPhone. Um, looking at something, maybe searching Google. So the next thing you do, this is what I do when I'm on travel. I got my own iPhone there for my alarm clock and I look to say, where is the closest Starbucks that I can go get some coffee? Um, okay, so these are called black swans um, because they were unanticipated things in computer science that changed, uh, changed the field and changed the world. We did not know that iPhones were going to exist or that Google was going to exist, um, but they, in, in, you know, so if you roll back 20 years ago. So, how important was all this stuff about Moore's Law and computing performance and those kinds of black swans? Well, if you go back 20 years into 1992, and you say everybody came up with all these great ideas, they had all the ideas behind the iPhone, they had all the ideas behind Google, what happens? Well, your iPhone is, um, that's actually a computer that was at NERSC at the time. NERSC uh, was located at Livermore, it's a Cray YMP. It, uh, it, it was their new scaled down model, supercomputer from Cray, and it, was, it weighed um, only a couple of tons. And so uh, you've now got a couple of tons sitting on your bed with you um, when you wake up to, to access your iPhone. Um, you go to Google. So how does Google work? Well, Google's data centers today use about 20 megawatts of power. But back in 1992, they would have used at least 20 gigawatts of power. Okay. So where, now Google, we all know this, Google is a green country, company. They, wa they really want to push green. So where can you get 20 gigawatts of power? Anybody know where you can get 20 gigawatts of green, green power? Water. Okay, but who, who knows where that is? Where's, where can you get a hydro, hydro gigawatt power plant? China, somebody said, that's right. Three Gorges Dam in China. Um, so now you have to, you, you got no network, by the way, that can get you uh, with high speed to Google if you want to download images. So you have to fly to China, go to the Google data center there, um, do your Google search um, at, right there at Three Gorges Dam, um, and now you can um, you get the information that you want out of Google. So the point of this is um, not that... Uh, um, it, it's just that, that in order to make these kinds of things happen, you needed to have computers that got much faster, much smaller, much cheaper, and much more energy efficient over the last 20 years. Or all of the great ideas that we've had in computing um, would not have happened, or many of them would not have happened. And so going forward, we can say, well, Google is kind of fast enough the way it is. My iPhone's kind of fast enough the way it is. What you don't know is 20 years from now, what will not happen if we can't make computers go um, you know, a thousand times or even um, a million times faster than they are today, which is what happened 20 years ago. Um, okay, so this, this is my mostly kind of a reference slide um, in case you're not familiar with all the terms, but there's, um, the, you know, these are all the different terms for how big computers can be and also how big memory can be. So um, starting with kila and then up to where, where are we at today? We're at petaflops in terms of the size of our systems petabyte store so that the cancer data that I talked about, two petabytes sitting um, in this data database for um, researchers to access. Um, the, the computer, the fastest computer we have today at NERSC is a petaflop system. We're all trying to figure out if we can build an exaflop system because like I said, we don't know what will happen if we can build an exaflop system, but we figured good things will happen with computing. So we're trying to do that. Um, and this is a history of the fastest scientific applications in the world, um, which are and the pictures of the computers on which they were run over about the last 20 years. Um, and this is a this, there's a prize that's given out by Gordon Bell every year um, at a conference called Supercomputing for the fastest computers in the world. I mean the fastest applications, so some kind of sim computer simulation running on these computers. And um, so back here at the beginning, you can see pictures of those vector supercomputers, those Cray computers. There were also NEC. Um, and uh, other, other companies that were building these, um, these vector supercomputers. 
What happened in the, the early 90s was uh, somebody gave a talk on attack of the killer micros. And this is where people started building networks of workstations. And we called it the NOW project here at Berkeley. Um, we clusters is the more popular phrase. So this is where we started taking microprocessors of the same kind that are in your laptops and, and were in servers at the time and then just connecting these things together into a big cluster. So that really changed the nature of this kind of high performance computing from these, these specialized vector supercomputers to these uh, clusters. Um, 2004, something really important happened, which is uh, processor manufacturers stopped figuring out how to make processors go any faster um, with even though they had more transistors on the chip. But because they had more transistors on the chip, they started just putting multiple cores on the chip. So now when you go out and buy your laptop, you get a Core 2 Duo. So I think you've heard about that a little bit in this class already. But the, so the rest of the world kind of woke up to parallel computing. There's our, our projected, hopefully, exascale computer in 2020. Um, it's actually, if we, if we believe the, uh, the trend, it would be in 2018, but I don't think we're probably going to get there in 2018. And um, so what is the big transition that's going to happen to help us get from where we are today? Um, we're not going to make the processors go any faster because they're too hot. So instead, we're looking at something like attack of the killer cell phone. So what does this mean? Um, the big problem in trying to build a computer that is a thousand times faster is energy. And that's true whether you're trying to build a cell phone that's a thousand times faster or you're trying to build a supercomputer that's a thousand times faster. Our supercomputers, for example, might be about a hundred cabinets, so a hundred you know, refrigerator sized boxes in the machine room. Um, and we don't want to make that a um, you know, thousand times bigger. And we don't want it to use a thousand times more power. Um, but the real problem here in building this is going to be energy. And cell phones, if you want to go out and talk to somebody who knows how to design an energy efficient computer processor, you talk to cell phone de designers. I thought that cell phones were limited by battery life, right? Because you want it to last all day long. Um, but in talking to one of them, they said it's actually the first thing that you do worry about battery life, but the first thing you worry about is how hot it is because people really do not like to walk around with hot cell phones in their pocket. Um, that's, uh, that's why you talk to cell phone designers. This is a picture of Hopper, which is our, our petascale supercomputer. Um, and it, just to give you an idea that has, um, it's got 150,000 processor cores. Each one of these is an AM, AMD chips inside of those. Each one of those chips has, um, has uh, 12 cores, a magni core processor. And now imagine you're doing one of these climate simulations. You've got this data structure with all these little pieces in it. It kind of maps onto a parallel, um, a parallel machine pretty easily because you, you, you take each one of those little um, icosahedron, uh, icosahedral meshes point cells and you put it on each one of the processors. And then they have to talk to each other in the middle of the simulation to say, hey, the temperature went up here, so it must have gone, gone up over there there or um, whatever whatever other physical aspects are happening. And that's true with a, a lot of all of the different physical simulations. For the, Most of them are done with these kinds of what's called domain decomposition. You divide up the domain and you give um, each domain to each processor. So um, now programming these things is a hard and interesting problem. Um, the machine, as I mentioned, is named after Grace Murray Hopper. And Grace Murray Hopper is known for a few things, um, but one of which was to popularize the phrase bug. So um, a picture right there is of the very first computer bug. The very first computer bug was a physical bug. It was a moth in the computer that caused the computer to not work. And, um, and Grace Marie Hopper uh, was the one who kind of made everybody start using this word for any time the computer didn't do what you wanted to do, we call it a computer bug. Um, she also, by the way, designed COBOL, the COBOL programming language, and um, was uh, one of the uh, kind of pioneers of, uh, of programming languages and computers. 